Okay, folks, if you want to go ahead and have a seat, I think we're going to get started so we can stay on track here. Thank you so much. Um, if you haven't signed in, please do. We have a sign-in sheet back there and printouts of the presentation for you to take notes on. Uh, just real quick, some housekeeping stuff while everyone's getting settled. Um, we have an emergency plan just in case there's an evacuation. I'm just going to read off this because I don't have it memorized. But uh, in case of emergency, please look around you and identify the two exits closest to you. We have exits on the back of the room and two on the sides. Um, in the event of a fire alarm, we are, we need to evacuate the room immediately, please. Take your valuables with you, but do not use the elevators. Use the stairwells. Um, we will, staff will try and assist you to the nearest exit, um, but you should also know that you may find an exit door by following the ceiling mounted exit signs. Um, evacuees will exit down the stairways uh, to, a, and to a relocation site across the street. Normally we go to Cesar Chavez Park. Um, if you cannot use the stairs, you will be directed to be um, to a protective vestibule until somebody can help you, um, and then we will relocate out of the building. Um, okay, if you need to use the restrooms, you can exit this door and go to the left, and there's restrooms down there and drinking fountains. Okay, so with that, my name is Anna Maria Sines. I'm an environmental scientist at the Division of Water Quality with um, at this here at the State Water Board. I want to introduce the team who's working on these procedures. So I want to introduce my supervisor. This is Bill Orm. Say hi, Bill. Um, we have our section chief. This is Paul Han. And then we also have our council. This is Serena Liu. So hello. So today we're here to discuss the procedures for discharges of dredger fill material uh, to waters of the state. These procedures have been revised since uh, we first released them in 2016. Uh, when developing your comments, we are especially interested in com on comments that you have on the revisions that we have made. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have provided you with uh, the presentation slides. If you would, please, as I'm going through this presentation, it'll take me about 30 minutes. Write down your questions and hold them till the end. I think a lot of your questions will probably overlap and we can um, answer them at the same time. Um, also, it's important to note that we're here today to inform your public comment and answer questions. We are not intending to accept formal comments today, uh, and but I will go over uh, at the end how formal comments should be submitted. Okay, so today I'm going to talk briefly about some background. We're going to talk about key elements and then a few key elements that have significant changes since the 2016 draft. Um, I'll go over next steps in the public process and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we did provide some green question cards, speaker cards, so if you do um, ask a question, just please fill them out for us and drop them off at the table on your way out just so we can try and keep track of who asked what and uh, for our notes and go back on our own reflection. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit what we intend these procedures to do. So these procedures will improve regulatory consistency. Uh, by providing a clear and consistent wetland definition, delineation methods, and a jurisdictional framework. Uh, they will also bring consistency between the regional and state water boards and align water boards application pro procedures with the federal procedures as much as we can. These will also strengthen regulatory effectiveness uh, by addressing state goals for wetland protection uh, through no net loss and a long-term net gain and will also help facilitate drought and climate change planning. These procedures will also uh, streamline the application process by uh, providing a uniform approach for the submittal review and approval of applications, as well as front-loading information requests from applicants. I want to talk a little bit about what these procedures will do and what they will not do. Um, what they will do, and this is um, a little bit from what I just mentioned, but we, these will establish how the water boards will identify, delineate, and regulate wetlands. They will align state procedures with federal procedures as much as possible and provide a consistent regulatory approach. As, as some of you may know, as of right now, the regional and the state boards, none of us apply the same set of rules. The, these will also improve um, regulatory effectiveness, which will in turn protect all waters of the state. So not, next, what these procedures do not do, these do not create a new regulatory program um, this is an existing program for some time now, and these procedures will not extend that program. These procedures have been um, on ongoing process since 2008. 
These procedures will not change the jurisdiction of the water boards. And then lastly, this will not change Clean Water Act protection. Uh, there, any uncertainty regarding the scope of Clean Water Act jurisdiction and the clean water rule won't affect the scope of these procedures. Okay, next, key elements of the procedures. First key elements are the wetlands around the wetlands, which is the wetland definition, delineation procedures, and jurisdictional framework. I'm going to go over these. Uh, the jurisdictional framework is new, and I'm going to go over each of these um, in more detail. The next key element is the application, submittal, and review. Um, excuse me, application, submittal, review, and approval process. These outline the items that are needed for a complete application and describe how the water boards will review and approve applications for dredger fill materials or impacts. It's important to note and remember that these application procedures apply to all waters of the state, not just wetlands, and apply only to individual orders, not general orders. So in the past presentations, I've gone through in detail uh, what these application procedures are. Today, I'm just going to go over the significant changes, and that is to the alternatives analysis requirement. But if you have questions about anything specific, we'll be sure to go over them during the questions portion of today. The next key element is the uh, exclusions from the procedures. These are areas and activities that are excluded from the application procedures, uh, such as ranching, farming, and silver culture. Uh, this does not mean, however, that these areas and activities are excluded from other uh, water board authorities. They're excluded specifically from these procedures. And most of these exclusions were built in uh, to align ourselves with the federal 404 process. The last key element is the state supplemental dredger fill guidelines. Uh, the, our Appendix A of the procedures uh, include relevant portions of the federal 404B1 guidelines. Um, Changes were made to the federal guidelines in order to make them consistent with state practices. Uh, we, we kept changes limited and omitted some portions that were um, illustrative examples or non-binding. We did need to make some global edits to make the federal terminology equivalent to the state terminology. The state supplemental guidelines still include major elements of the federal guidelines, such as um, requirements applicants must first avoid and then minimize and then finally compensate for unavoidable impacts. Okay, next I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about our proposed definition. This has not changed from the previous draft that we released in 2016. It requires the presence of hydrology, anaerobic conditions, and, vegeta and if vegetation is present, that, that vegetation needs to be dominated by hydrophytes. Um, however, a wetland can meet the definition if there, if there is no vegetation present. Uh, this definition would apply to all water board programs, but not to other agencies. That's one of the comments that we received, that there's concern that the public may think that this definition will apply to everyone in California, but it will be used by the water boards. Other comments that we received um, on the 2016 draft surrounded recommendations for us to adopt the federal definition or a more inclusive one or two parameter definition. We are not proposing to adopt the federal definition because there are limited differences between that and our proposed definition. Um, features that are unvegetated could meet the federal definition when we apply the regional supplements uh, or could be regulated as a uh, special aquatic site under the 404 viewing guidelines. This definition was developed by a technical advisory team that was comprised of state wetland scientists and managers in California uh, who found the proposed definition to encompass the diversity found in California. So that's another reason why we are proposing um, to go with their recommendation. Okay. Next, just uh, briefly, I'm going to touch on the delineation procedures. This also has not changed from the previous draft. Um, we are proposing to adopt the Corps 87 Wetland Delineation Manual and the regional supplements for the arid west, western mountains, valleys, and coast regions. Uh, we received a lot of comments reflecting concern that if we adopt the, these delineation manuals um, and requiring delineation reports that we would be creating a duplicative process. Uh, we're, that is, that isn't a requirement to submit uh, an additional delineation report, provided that the report includes all waters within the project area. So if you submit a delineation report to the core that has all the waters in it, that will work for our application requirements as well. 
Okay, so next I'm gonna get into the, our proposed jurisdictional framework. This is gonna be a few slides, so bear with me. This is gonna be a lot of information for you, but we wanna make sure that you get it all. The wetland definition that I just discussed was not developed with jurisdiction in mind. The 2016 draft that we released um, allowed for the determinations of all waters of the state to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we received a lot of comments on this asking us to limit those case-by-case -case determinations, and we agreed that uh, we should offer more clarity and guidance on this. So we we're pr proposing this framework to limit those determinations. So before I get into details, though, I want to remind everyone that there are some features that are waters of the state, as you can see from this graphic, but are not wetlands, such as streams, lakes, and oceans. Uh, there are some features that would meet the technical definition of what is a wetland, but are not waters of the state, such as some artificial features, features that have not been regulated by the water boards in the past. So when we were trying to develop this framework, we were faced with a challenge of trying to transform this technical wetland definition into a framework that would provide regulatory certainty while still being protective. And uh, also before I go on, we received a lot of comments asking us to define all waters of the state, not just wetlands. Uh, we, I do wanna communicate that we did not propose to do that at this time. It is out of the scope of the current project and we also didn't have the technical support to do so. However, the Water Board may ask us to undertake this at a later time. So I just wanna reiterate the, um, that if an area is not a wetland, this framework that we're about to go over would not be applied, but it still could be another water of the state. This framework only applies to wetlands. So now I'm gonna get into what exactly the framework is. So first I wanna talk about what, about what would always be a water of the state. All natural wetlands will always be a water of the state. These are wetlands that exist independent of human assistance. Uh, and they include, and it includes small vulnerable features such as vernal pools or seasonal wetlands. It also includes wetlands that are created as a result of a modification of another wetland or converted to a wetland due to modification of another water of the state. That's a mouthful, so I'm gonna try and give you an example. Um, a wetland, perhaps, that was converted to a finishing pond for wastewater treatment. Um, we hope that doesn't happen, but just in case, uh, we would, that would be water of the state because it was a natural wetland before it was converted. Okay, so third, uh, wetlands that are waters of the US are always gonna be waters of the state by default. Um, and then also we have some artificial wetlands that are waters of the state, such as those that are created as mitigation, artificial wetlands that are created as mitigation for to offset impacts. Wetlands that are artificial, but they are designated in a regional water quality control board basin plan or a water quality control plan. <clears throat> And then also wetlands that persist as a result of some human activity and have become a relatively permanent part of the landscape. This is important. This particular one is important because of how modified the landscape in California has become. Um, this, may in, this may include an abandoned parking lot that has developed wetland features and functions that support beneficial uses. Artificial wetlands that are greater than one, e one acre in size unless they are created and maintained for a specific purpose. I'm gonna talk about those purposes in a minute, but first I wanna talk about that one acre threshold. We have proposed a size threshold because the definition of artificial is very broad. Uh, and if left alone, it could exclude features, um, in a, inappropriately exclude features that are of legitimate concern that we wanna protect. Also, the water boards have not regulatory, um, regularly asserted jurisdiction over small temporary features, and applying a size threshold would exclude those features um, using a specific lim size limitations. Um, this would provide regulatory certainty for the community. This is one area that we're asking specific feedback on, so please let us know what you think um, when developing your comments on this draft. Okay, 
So next, um, let's talk about those specific purposes real quick. I'm just gonna read this off the slide. An artificial wetland is a water of the state if it is greater than or equal to one acre in size, unless that artificial wetland was constructed and is currently used and maintained primarily for one or more of the following purposes. And here's a list of the purposes. This is straight from the procedures, um, how it's written in there. One of those um, pr purposes we have listed there is a cooling pond, cooling water pond. Uh, and it, I've provided a picture of you and I just wanna go over a hypothetical example. Purely hypothetical. We would go over a lot more technical uh, background that just for the presentation's purposes to try and explain the, what we're intending. Apply the framework that we just went over to determine if this feature would be a wetland water of the state. First, I wanna assume that this area meets the technical definition of a wetland because that's the first thing, the first box that we need to check. Does it meet the definition? Yes, then we'll apply the framework. If no, it could be another water of the state. Next, I wanna find out if this cooling pond was converted from another water of the state or if the core is regulating it as a water of the US. If any of those boxes are checked, yes, it is a water of the state. I find out that it isn't. Uh, and so lastly, I wanna make sure that this cooling pond hasn't been abandoned and is being currently maintained for its stated purpose. I find out that it is, that they are using it for that purpose so I can make the determination that this is not a water of the state and subject to these procedures. So before I go on, just a quick side note that just because we're saying that these wetlands are not a water of the state, uh, as per this framework, does not mean that we will not regulate discharges from these features that would affect other waters. So that is a lot of information that we just went over, so I just wanna take a quick break before we get in, because the next part is also gonna be a lot of information. So just drink a water for myself real quick. <laughs> This picture camping in Mendocino County a couple weeks ago, so I thought I'd bring a little bit of the cool air with me. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna go over a lot of the um, application submittal procedures in detail, but we are gonna go over the alternatives analysis requirement because we did receive a lot of comments surrounding this. So real quick, simply put, uh, an alternatives analysis is an opportunity for staff and applicants to work together to ensure that impacts to waters of the state are avoided. Previously, we asserted that this requirement um, would be determined on a case-by-case -case basis by regional board staff um, when, in cases when the core would not require one. Yeah, we received a lot of comments asking us to minimize these case-by-case -case determinations. Just like the jurisdictional framework, we agreed that we should uh, offer more clarity on this issue. So first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this, this framework. First, I'm gonna describe when the water boards would defer to the core in cases when they require an alternatives analysis. In cases when the core would not, we would require one unless one of the exemptions apply. And then I'm gonna go over those exemptions. If one of the exemptions does not apply to the project, then we have um, developed a process for knowing what level of effort is needed for that alternatives analysis. Basically, what would happen is that applicants and water board staff would put projects into tiers or bends um, based on quantitative and qualitative data, criteria, excuse me. And the tier that the project falls into would determine the level of analysis that's required for the application. Um, before I get into details in the next slide, I just wanna make everyone aware that these steps proceed in a different order in the procedures that I'm about ready to go over them. So if you to give us a call if you have questions later after this or we'll go over it in more detail after. Okay, so the first part of the framework. These, this is cases where the core does require an alternatives analysis for individual 404 permits. In these cases, the core will defer, defer to the core's determination unless any of the following happens. 
unless the water boards were not provided an adequate opportunity to collaborate in the development of that alternatives analysis. Basically, what we were doing is we're, we're encouraging applicants to come to us sooner and start talking to us about what those alternatives are and how they will comply and not violate state water quality standards. We also would not defer if uh, concerns that we raised during that collaboration were not addressed. And then lastly, we would not defer to the core if the project itself does not comply with water quality standards. But this is, I just want to say that this is true for all projects. Um, if a project does not comply with water quality standards, we can just deny it outright. Um, it is not dependent on the alternatives analysis requirement. So in any of these cases that I've listed though, we have um, set it up so the executive director or the executive officer would need to determine that additional analysis would be needed from the applicant. Okay, so again, we just described cases when the core would re require an alternatives analysis and we would defer to the core. If that is not the case, we would require one unless an alternatives analysis unless one of these exemptions applies. And so next we're gonna go over these exemptions. The first one reflects a change that was made from the previous version of the procedures um, that stated that if a project qualifies for a water board certified general order, such as the subset of pre-certified nationwide permits, then it would be exempt from the alternatives analysis requirement. When making revisions to the procedures, we remove this exemption because the application submittal review and approval section of the procedures only applies to individual orders, not general orders. So it's, it didn't make sense to keep that in there since it wouldn't apply. <clears throat> we kept in this exclusion though, however, because um, we see it fitting that if a the exclusions should extend to projects that would qualify for the general order if that project impacts waters outside of federal jurisdiction. Trying to see how many blank stares I have coming back at me. Um, if that doesn't make sense, we'll definitely go through it more um, later on. Okay, the next exclusion would be if it is an ecological restoration enhancement project. This, these, this is denied in our procedures in the definition section, section five. And then if the project, the, um, the project would be exempt from an alternatives analysis requirement if it's planned in accordance with a watershed plan that's been approved by the water boards. And then lastly, and this is a new exemption that we're proposing here, that the project would be exempt from the alternatives analysis requirement if the project does not permanently impact aquatic resources or impact a list of sensitive habitat. We have a list of sensitive habitats um, in the procedures that if it impacted those, then it also would not be exempt. Okay, so we've, we've gone through our framework. The core did not require an alternatives analysis. We do not qualify for one of the exemptions. So we do need to submit an alternatives analysis to the water boards. So now we're gonna apply a framework for what level of effort is needed for that alternatives analysis. When going through it in establishing this framework, we found it difficult because not all projects meet, merit the same level of effort or degree of analysis is probably a better way of saying it. Um, for example, a project that can't be located in an alternate location wouldn't need to look at offsite and onsite alternatives. We have established qualitative and quantitative criteria to bend these projects to better determine the level of analysis needed. And then also, although some projects cannot be located in different locations, we see to work with applicants on alternate methods during the application process. Um, for example, we, wanna, it, we may want an applicant to look at bioengineering methods rather than installing riprap or hardlining a channel for bank stabilization. Um, I do wanna flag that this is a minor change from the previous procedures. We had labeled this as an exemption before, but then still said the on-site alternatives would, still, would need to be looked at. Now this is built into the tiered framework. Yes. Uh, this is a minor change from the previous procedures in that in the 2016 draft, we labeled this as an exemption and said that if a project cannot be located in an alternate location, we would still require the on-site alternatives that need to be looked at. But now we have built it into the tiered framework.
Okay. So the bins or the tiers are based on threat and complexity, where the greater the threat and the more complex the project, the higher level of analysis is needed. I do want to say that no matter which bin the tier um, project, the, which tier the project falls into, the water boards would have to determine that that pr proposed altern alternative is the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, or the lead pipe. Okay, so here are the tiers. I'm not gonna read it off the slides for you, but the, we're just gonna go over them briefly. The first tier is the, would require the highest level of analysis, and we would ask applicants to look at on-site and off-site alternatives. Uh, if, they, if the project exceeds the um, quantity of it, quantities of impacts on the screen, or it impacts these sensitive species areas such as vernal pools or seep wetlands. Tier two level uh, alternatives analysis is uh, on-site alternatives only. Um, this is if it falls within the thresholds or it cannot be located in an alternate location. Tier one alternatives analysis is a description of avoidance and minimization measures, and this is our lowest, um, lowest level of analysis. It's important to note that the size criteria includes both temporary and permanent impacts. And we also built into the procedures that the water board staff can allow for a reduction of analysis uh, if they see that that is appropriate for that project. But we did not allow for an increased level of analysis. Okay, so I just wanna briefly go over some other minor, minor clarifications. That's it for the alternatives analysis, but I'm sure we'll have a good discussion about it. Um, other minor clarifications to the procedures include um, some changes to, or more detail on what's needed in a restoration plan when restoring temporary impacts to pre-project conditions. Uh, we also made some minor clarifications to the portions of the procedures that outline areas and activities that are excluded from the application procedures. Particularly, we removed the exclusion for the constructed treatment wetlands uh, because now that exclusion is built into our jurisdictional framework. We also made some clarifying edits to um, compensatory mitigation requirements, so you'll see some red lines in there. And then we also made some clarifications to the definitions of what is a watershed plan, what is a watershed profile, and what is an ecological restoration enhancement project. Real quickly, I want to go over some program improvements that we are working on in addition to these procedures. Uh, we're looking into making upgrades, upgrades to the um, allowance for electronic submittals and tracking of applications and reports. Uh, we are looking into increasing the use of other regulatory tools such as um, writing more general orders or revising the general orders that we have already. Uh, we are continuing to develop a statewide template for use by the water boards for our certifications that we are issuing. And then we have also implemented statewide performance measures that you can find on the water board's website. Um, these performance measures look at things such as how long it takes us to deem an application complete or how long it's taken us to issue certifications. These do not relate to performance measures when for compensatory mitigation or anything like that. Um, the, and also here at the State Water Board, we have undergone a business review and improvement process to help us implement improvements and speed up our application process. Okay, so next steps, we're almost through this presentation. Next steps in the public process, we are currently in the public comment period, which began, began on July 21st. We are holding two public workshops today, and next week we'll be traveling down to San Diego. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I want to emphasize that we're here today to, to inform your comments and answer your questions. Any comments that you do need to be submitted in writing or to the State Water Board at the public hearing, which will be on September 6th. Written comments are due the next day on the 7th. Uh, we are hoping to take this to our board for consideration by the end of the year and, and see if we can hopefully make that goal. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, when we go through this, we just need to say that we are recording this um, webcasting for people who aren't able to make it in per person. So Bill and Alex and Brendan are gonna be walking around with microphones. So if you do have a question, please speak into the microphone and um, 
for all of our purposes, please state your name and what agency that you are from. Okay. Anybody want to get us started and been brave enough to start off with a question? Please. Oh. Good morning. I'm uh, Sam Garcia with Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Hi. Um, you made a statement a few moments ago about uh, the board's requirement to make a decision on LEDPA. And I'm curious um, if the Corps of Engineers is also making a decision on the same alternatives analysis. Does the board make an independent decision? And if so, what have you thought of the process by which you reconcile differences that might, if the board identifies a LEDPA that's different than the Corps' identification of the LEDPA? Um, so what we would do is we would, if the core is requiring alternatives analysis and making a determination on that alternatives analysis, the way we have it set up is we would defer to that determination. So our determination would be the same as the core's, unless all of those things that I listed, we weren't included in the um, collaboration of that. We want to be able to make sure that we're saving um, ourselves and applicants time and uh, definitely um, protecting water quality standards to make sure that that preferred alternative meets what we need it to do also. Did I answer your question? Uh, do we have another question in the back? No, but I oh. Okay. So just for, since uh, we're recording, please wait for the microphone to come to you. But the rest of the question that I didn't answer is what is the process for that? How are we going to apply that um, in the, well, <laughs> So we do have the option to deny the certification if the, if the applicants, if we weren't co um, collaborated, but we're, we collaborated with. Um, that's of course the last thing that we want to do. Um, we want to work with the core and work with applicants to um, to come to the best outcome for the project. So the process would be. You have an application. You're proposing a project. Come talk to us as soon as you start talking to the core for your pre-application um, consultation so that we can go over the, per the alternatives and work with you to determine the pr preferred alternative that works for both agencies. Um, there's another question back. Javier, you want to have a question? Here's the microphone for you. I just, I just want to add a little to what the State Board's saying, because Region 2, we do require alternatives analysis right now. So in the San Francisco Bay region, it's in our basin plan. And when there is a lack of coordination between the core and the region two, uh, which does happen occasionally, most often it, do it doesn't. Um, what we ask for is uh, supplemental information with the alternatives analysis. And very rarely do we end up with different lead puzzles. It, it really doesn't happen. The majority actually is uh, of the, LEDPA analysis is for um, some of the nationwide permits, and then it would be a, a whole separate uh, alternatives analysis. Thank you. So I, I just have a few more questions on that process because um, I've been involved in at least two large projects in Southern California where we asked for pre-application coordination and they denied involvement. We tried to file a 401 cert application and they said it was too preliminary and they wouldn't get involved. And in one of the two, they then second guessed the LEDPA. So it, will there be some guidance with these procedures to make sure that doesn't happen anymore if the regional board is now going to be um, instructed specifically to um, review and make an independent determination about the LEDPA? So again, we, we wouldn't be making an independent determination in cases where the core would also require one. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we definitely want to implement measures in order to help facilitate these procedures um, during the implementation phase. And that means working with the regional boards to try and figure out how to facilitate um, pre-application consultations. Um, try and we, we're definitely going to ask the applicants to work with us on that. You know, and um, I. I understand your frustration that you reached out and weren't able to get the help that you needed. Um, 
but I, I guess I can't say that we can guarantee that it will never happen again. Uh, we can do our best to. Anne Marie, can I jump in? This yes, is please. Serena Lou, and this is um, a time when it's helpful to go back to the actual language of the procedures, and the an instance in which we would not defer to the core's uh, alternatives analysis is when the permitting authority was not provided an adequate opportunity to collaborate. So that does not mean if we were provided the opportunity and we declined that opportunity, that's different than when we were never invited to the table at all. Doesn't matter, <laughs> which is what always what happens. Yeah. Yes, but if water quality standards aren't being met, that's a basis for us to the, deny the application now and in future applications. I think there's some confusion about this. The alternatives analysis would never bind the permitting authority to approve an application that violated water quality standards. But hopefully the idea is that they would be making that determination up front. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. So what, what we want to see these procedures prevent and what the language doesn't prevent right now is it doesn't prevent them from declining to participate then they couldn't say, oh, well, you know, um, we get an another crack at the lead bub because we didn't get an opportunity to participate. But it would allow them to decline to participate and then second gets the lead pub because it doesn't meet water quality standards and do that very late in the process. And that's what we're worried about. Uh, hey, Cliff Moriyama, it, for those three parameters that's on the slide right now, is it an and or an or? Do they have to deal with all three, or is just one? Or. I think it's, it's or. an or. I'm gonna have to double check. It should be or. Any, if, so if any it's one or. of those, then the deference triggers water board action. Um, I'm sorry, Cliff. Could you? I was looking at my notes. Um, right. Yeah. That's. So Cliff, the, um, certainly if the project doesn't meet water quality standards, um, that's that's a potentially could be raised at the at the point of the LEDPA. Um, the other two are things that kind of follow sequentially. I mean, first we have to to have the opportunity to um, to uh, collaborate, and then you know the second bullet there kind of presupposes that we have already provided um, um, information to the core. I will also point out that the actual language does note that. These issues, if there's an issue with the LEDPA, um, that that needs to be communicated in writing to the Corps of Engineers, and that letter needs to come out from the executive officer. So we think there's sufficient um, procedural protections in place to make sure that this doesn't um, end up, um, at least certainly not, in, except in exceptional circumstances, this should not be a situation where you end up with. Um, significant conflicts with the course process. Hey, I'm Michael Miller with the um, Wine Grape Growers. I'm kind of new to this, so forgive me if this is a um, question you previously discussed. The definition of wetlands refers to uh, WOTUS uh, in both current and historic definitions. How are you going to consider changes in WOTUS and how it's applied, how it's considered by courts under this administration and moving forward, how you consider those changes and how you apply this? So the best, um, part of the purpose of including that as part of our jurisdictional framework is that it makes sense that if you have a wetland that has been or is currently regulated as a water of the U.S., we expect to continue to regulate them as that. So those are the easiest cases where there's a preliminary jurisdictional determination or an approved jurisdictional determination. We intend to be consistent with how it's been regulated. Going forward, um, this is uh, the part of the reason why we included this as only one of the criteria for jurisdictional determinations is because there's uncertainty regarding the waters of the U.S definition on the federal level. And so you could use one of the other criteria. So if there's uncertainty about whether it's a water of the US, uh, we still are including all natural wetlands. So if it's natural wetland, it's in regardless of what future 
uh, rules may say. And there will be a little bit of a, we'll have to wait and see with the next administration or the current administration if they are successfully able to promulgate a new definition of waters of the U.S. Um, I, judging from your face, it doesn't quite get to your question, though. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, Kevin Fisher with uh, Horizon Water Environment Consulting. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, the, the, the tiered alternative analysis requirement refer to um, linear feed of waters. At the onset of the presentation, you mentioned this was a wetlands policy. So how is a, a threshold that's for impacts to waters um, contained within this policy? Okay, thank you. And just want to make it clear that this is a uh, procedures for the regulation of dischargers to waters of the state, which includes wetlands. So the alternatives analysis, it includes the wetland definition, delineation procedures, and a framework for wetlands. But the application procedures, including the alternatives analysis, applies to all waters of the state. So those linear um, criteria would apply to any waters, including wetlands. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, just one additional question is, can you explain how your um, mitigation preferences are aligned or not aligned with the core's preferences for um, mitigation banking and LUFI permitting responsible mitigation? Sure, definitely. So um, we have, we are proposing to adopt the state supplemental dredge and fill guidelines, which um, is largely most of this, the 404B1 guidelines, including subpart J. Uh, which also adopts the soft preference for the mitigation banks and LUFI programs and then permittee responsible mitigation. So it is the same. Microphone recognition. Hi, I'm Rachel Zwillinger with Defenders of Wildlife. Hi, Rachel. Um, first, thank you to staff for all of the changes that you made in this new draft. I think this is a lot more clear and a lot more protective of state resources. Uh, one particular question about the exemptions to the alternatives analysis requirements. The first one particularly, um, I am concerned with the way that it is drafted and want to understand if you are intending for it to be the way that I'm reading it or if there is a different intent. And particularly, I read this exemption um, to exclude from the alternatives analysis um, a project where dis, where it has discharges to both waters of the U.S. and waters of the state. The discharges to waters of the U.S. comply with the terms of a board certified general order, but the discharges to the waters of the state do not. That even in that circumstance, the way that the alternatives analysis, the exemption is worded, it seems like it could exclude that project, which seems problematic. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so let me give a little bit of background about what we're trying to accomplish with that um, exemption for nationwide permits. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more broadly about how the edits were made within this document. Um, this is gonna seem like a little bit of a bird walk, but trust me, I'll, I'll get to your question. Um, when we did the revisions, um, we realized that we had a section that talked about exemptions from alternatives analysis, and it was in the portion of the procedures that was written for a regional board audience. And we realized that actually these exemptions from the alternatives analysis are more applicable to the applicant than to the, um, than to the regional boards. And so we moved that whole section into the into the application portion. Trust me, I'm going someplace with this. Okay, so when we move that text, there were a number of exemptions in the original text that have been modified. Um, one of those exempt and, and um, Anna Maria talked about the uh, the how we removed the exemption for site-specific projects and we built that into the tiers. She mentioned that on the slides, that's one example. This nationwide permit language is another one of those examples. The intention here is twofold. First of all, we wanna make sure that it's clear that 
um, projects that are meeting a certified nationwide permit through that certification, we've already reviewed those from the standpoint of an alternatives analysis, and we don't think there's any additional alternatives analysis uh, required. So we wanna be really clear about that. If it um, qualifies for a certified nationwide permit, there will be no additional alternatives analysis. Now, if you are carefully doing a cross-reference between the old language and the new language, um, and it's, again, because we moved the sections, it's not real straightforward to do, but I, I just wanna emphasize here that that particular exemption, that actual language in the policy has been removed, but it's not that we intended to get rid of the exemption for certified nationwide permits, is that we recognize that for some procedural reasons, it was already included in the language on the general orders. Again, I'm going someplace with this. <clears throat> so goal one is we wanna be really clear that if you are covered under a certified nationwide general permit, you should not expect to have an additional alternatives analysis. Now, one of the other goals that we have with this pro with these procedures is that we want to um, harmonize our procedures with waters of the state and with waters of the US to the extent feasible. So we'd like for applicants to have a single process whether or not they are in waters of the state or waters of the US. So when we moved this exemption language, we revised it so that if you are if you have a project that crosses over from nationwide uh, crosses over from waters of the US to waters of the state or a project that um, is it located solely within water of the state, and that that location is the only reason why you wouldn't qualify for a nationwide permit, a certified nationwide permit. We didn't want you guys to have to go through and do an alternatives analysis just because it happened to be in a water of the state. So, Rachel, to answer your question, yes, the intention is that when you um, are have a project that would qualify for a nationwide permit, you can... Um, be exempted from the alternatives analysis provided the project is consistent with the terms and conditions of the of that nationwide permit. So that is our intention. Can I, I realize that's a long-winded answer, but that's the that's the end of the. Can I jump in? And I think this comes from a slightly different angle, and it might answer hopefully more directly. But so, <laughs> no offense, Paul. That's okay. Um, that's okay. Lots so of I ideas think, packed in there. I think what you're going with. Uh, comply with the terms of the nationwide permit will be handled as a condition of the individual order. So just because they don't have to do an alternatives analysis, their conditions and their um, individual WDR for the water of the state portion could be comply with the nationwide permit conditions or incorporating it by reference. And I, I think that's the more appropriate place to handle it. So they don't have to do an alternative. So say, uh, I'm going to use an example of a uh, nationwide permit we have certified as uh, survey activities. You have survey activities that affect waters of the st U.S. and non-federal waters of the state. So that for the waters of the U.S. portion, you can use our general certification, and, and that requires that you comply with the nationwide. And for the portion that's non-federal waters of the U.S., you would need an individual order, and you wouldn't have to do an alternatives analysis but that wouldn't prevent the water boards from applying any appropriate conditions, such as can blot, you know, if you're doing in-water work, do X, Y, Z. Okay. And so my concern remains, I think that's helpful clarification, but that the way that this is drafted, even if what you're doing in a water of the state outside of federal jurisdiction is different, than what would have been covered by the nationwide permit if those discharges were to a water of the state, it would be excluded from an alternatives analysis requirement. When you say a different activity, do you mean the, the activities in the non-federal portion you don't think would should qualify for a nationwide permit? In the case that they don't or okay. they wouldn't. And then in, in, in that case, then they would go into the tiered managed level of effort and we would okay. require one. And so that's what I was wondering. That seems to be the intent, but I don't think that's what this says. Okay. Okay. I think we understand your, okay. your concern. So now. if you if that, you have if you have recommendations for language, that that'd be a great thing to put in the comments. Okay, but that's helpful yeah. to understand that that is the intent. Yes. Okay. So for example, if it exceeded the impact restrictions that are in a nationwide permit. Right. Yes. Okay. We understand. 
I think John Lane back there has been in his turn. Hi, this is John Lane with Tecker Materials, and I wanted to actually agree with Rachel and, and commend staff on all the work that's been done. It's been clear that you guys have been working a lot on this for a while, and it is a lot clearer. Um, having said that, um, I, I still have, I want to go back to slide 13. We were talking a little bit about alternatives analysis, and I, I want to pick a little bit more on this point. Um, on, on number two, bullet number two, really that's where my personal concern still comes in, and that is, as an applicant, we're going to work really hard, and we've always worked hard to collaborate at the start. It's called a 401 cert for a reason, so the, so the third point, it's got to be certified. But the second point, really, it, it, its fundamental statement is, is, that, is, is that the core and everybody is going to all agree at the end to get through the process. And so my question here is, is that the core has, in its comments, is clear that it's saying that, that, that the state needs to defer to them. So like, for example, in comment 41.7, they say the core is concerned about the, the procedures are, uh, and their consistency with the core program, and then it states straight out, deference should be given to the core regulatory program. And then the response of the water board is, is, that, is that we're encouraging coordination and we're going to do everything we can when possible, but then two comments, so two responses later, it's the the board says it's not appropriate to defer to the core regarding blah 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 and so throughout the procedures we're really there's to me there's still a fairly unresolved question and that is the core is saying that the state needs to defer and the response of the water board is we're always going to work really hard and do what we can but isn't there still a pretty large unresolved issue with the core and the state agreeing in the end so that your final product, the permits and the certification all agree so you don't end up in gridlock. So short answer, yeah. I think that there is still, you know, some clarity and things that we could offer to do that. But I think it's, it's to, you know, give more um, consistency and more clarity as to how this process will work. And that, you know, I think it's, it's it's kind of, it's hard to do because we, we, you know, knock on the corps, the Army Corps of Engineers, we can knock on their door and ask them, please work with us, but we can't make them. Um, and we definitely want to increase our interagency collaboration, and we're trying to do everything that we can to do so. We have had uh, behind the scenes um, conversations with the corps and talking to them about these procedures. Uh, so I definitely hear your concern, and um, I'm going to go back and look at those um, comments and the response to comments to see what you're um, referring to exactly. Uh, but I mean, does anybody have anything to add, Bill? Well, you wanna well I'll, I'll add that you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I think what you're asking for is if push comes to shove, go the way the core says. And um, I, I can understand why you'd want that from your perspective, but at the end of the day, we do have regulatory authority over these resources. We do have a regulatory mandate to meet, and we aren't in a position to abdicate that authority um, in the interest of pure efficiency. And so there may be some situations where we, the, that are going to be harder to resolve than others. Um, we have done everything that we can do with the procedures to try to minimize those, those situations. Um, those include, you know, being pretty clear about when we would defer to the core, being pretty clear about when we wouldn't defer to the core, and making sure that if we aren't going to defer to the core, that that, that messaging comes from the highest level of management um, so that it's, there's no question that management is engaged and, and that there's a level of oversight necessary to assure, ensure that we get to a resolution. So yeah. that's, um, I, I don't know that I can, I, I don't know how we could resolve that short of abdicating our, our responsibility on that. Yeah, and, and I would add, John, that uh, this uh, alternatives analysis procedure uh, that we're adopting, it's to avoid the case where at the last at the 11th hour, the water boards are able to come in and go, gee, you know, you didn't uh, really, uh, uh, you didn't really address our water quality issues. And the, and the core would be on, on the side of the fence of, well, you know, that's your job. You're, you're supposed to bring to the table what are the water quality issues in the state's eyes. So how does that conversation happen? 
We envision it happening through this alternatives analysis procedure where the water boards can actually team up with the core so that when the best alternative is arrived at for the project, it includes a conversation with the water boards addressing water quality issues. That's what the core wants through the certification process, but it's never, as far as their procedures go, it's never, it hasn't been built in to date. This will ensure that we're building in this communication about the best alternative, including water quality objectives. And we think that it's actually gonna smooth out the process and make it more efficient. Robert Gore from the Gualco Group. Was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers invited to this proceeding? Yes, and we have had um, a number of discussions with the uh, with the Corps of Engineers and have ongoing discussions with them about that. Um, you know, as we've said before, we're interested in ultimately pursuing a memorandum of understanding with the Corps of Engineers. I'm sure it's no secret, based on their last uh, their last uh, comment letter, that um, we have some work to do to get both sides to the table on that. And um, when you present to uh, the board, I've witnessed some other major issues in which there is a interagency panel of experts, DWR and some of our other colleagues. Uh, would the U.S. Army Corps of en Engineers be invited to your expert panel when you present to the board? Not sh I'm well, for example, drought uh, uh, re resiliency and the drought response included several state agencies that would opine to the board about what was going on. In this case, perhaps uh, to ensure collaboration and cooperation, the Corps might be invited to join you guys. So apart from the, from the hearing to receive comments, we don't have any public meetings before the board on this issue? When you present the um, regulation, the policy. That would be at the hearing and certainly... Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. So maybe, let me try. Um, so these staff workshops that were here, this isn't a formal proceeding. This is, right. you know, we're here inviting here to answer questions for informational purposes to inform your comments. It, I agree that it would have been helpful for a representative of the Corps to be here to join the conversation. They were invited, and um, unless somebody's going to speak up and we have a sleeper in the crowd, it doesn't seem like it. Um, we, as far as going in front of the core, we're going to ask, you know, um, excuse me, going in front of the water board, we're going to have a hearing for the public to come and um, give their comments. And are you asking if we are inviting a representative from the core to that to um, present these, to present comments to the board? Is that your question? Y yes. For example, okay. the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation was frequently a guest star um, on the early drought uh, uh, processes, uh, so there's considerable precedent for having them join you at the staff uh, panel. Okay, that's something that we can take into consideration. Thank you. And as of, I guess to answer your question, um, as of right now, no, we haven't. I didn't know there were two. Hi, I'm Melissa Thorne from Downey Brand. I have a couple questions on the definition. Um, one in footnote. Too, it talks about current or historic federal regulations. So I'm wondering whether the state current regulation falls into that historic. And the reason is, is it had exemptions in there for things like puddles, swimming pools, you know, water parks, ditches, and whether you are going to say those are exempted as well. So one important clarification that I thought of after our initial question about this is we're saying the waters of the U.S. will help define what is considered part of our jurisdiction, in other words, what's in, but we will not be using any water of the U.S. rules to determine what's out because the water board's jurisdiction has always been broader than the federal jurisdiction, and so we, consider, we believe that it is appropriate for it to help consider what's in but not what's out. Okay, but then are you going to have express exemptions for things like swimming pools, water parks, roadside ditches, puddles, so it's very clear what is not in the definition? We are not intending to add any express exemptions other than what's currently in the framework. So, for example, let's go with swimming pools. The current framework only applies to wetlands, so unless your swimming pool has some wetland areas surrounding it, um, then this jurisdictional framework wouldn't apply and 
the status quo applies. But say you have a swimming pool with artificial wetlands on the side, maybe it's a fancy no entry pool. It is likely, let's assume that meets the technical definition, we would probably call that an artificial wetland because I'm assuming you built your swimming pool. And it, unless your swimming pool is, the wetland area is over one acre, then it's probably excluded. But if you built your swimming pool, for example, in an existing stream, then we would probably not classify that as a swimming pool, but maybe that could qualify for one of the other categories. But no, we, at this time, we are not intending to create a separate list of saying things like swimming pools or puddles are always outside of the water board jurisdiction. And, okay. and I will add to that that we did consider that early on. And what we found was that we were just pushing the definitional problems out further. Um, a specific example, we were having this discussion as late as yesterday about whether he even mentioned puddles on our slides. And one of the reasons why we didn't is because the, the definition of a puddle is as hard to put into regulatory language as is the definition of a wetland. So at the end of the day, it doesn't seem um, useful for us to provide those list of exclusions because it just pushes the question one more rung down the ladder. Okay, so I have one more question on the um, exemptions for artificial wetlands. It, it, it doesn't apply if it was constructed and used for one of these purposes that's listed. So for example, treatment, plant ponds, or stormwater detention. But some of those facilities, you have this language that says, unless they also satisfy another one of the above criteria, which is that it resulted from historic human activity has become relatively permanent part of the natural landscape. So for example, you have a huge stormwater detention basin. It can look kind of like a wetland. It's going to be relatively permanent. So does that pull that out of the exemption then? If that stormwater detention basin uh, has been built in a water of the state or was converted from a wetland, a natural wetland, then that would pull it back into jurisdiction. However, if it is currently being used and maintained and it's completely artificial and doesn't meet any of the other criteria that we have listed on this slide, then it would be excluded from the jurisdictional But what I'm saying not. is it would potentially meet the some artificial wetlands bullet three. So it's actually technically above this above criteria, but are you just meaning one, two, and three? So I guess for this bullet, what we intended it to be is more like abandoned areas. So um, so it's not clear. And well, so there, okay. there's a few there's a few words in there that are important. Um, one is historic, and historic um, uh, is not something that's active. Is not a historic thing. Um, it, you're talking about relatively permanent. It would have to have self-sustaining hydrology. So again, a, a stormwater or a um, uh, wastewater treatment facility may not have that. Um, we're looking in California at a really highly modified. Um, a highly modified um, water system here in, the, in California. One of the things that we realized is by creating this partition between natural features and artificial features and then defining artificial so broadly, we needed to make sure that we included some, some reasonable constraints. And one of those reasonable constraints that we looked at was, okay, let's assume that something 50, 60, 70 years ago um, got modified for some reason and um, either A, it was unclear whether or not it was, why it was modified or who did the modification or what that mm -hmm. modification was for. Um, and um, B, since that time, it, it's, it's just part of the landscape. It's there. It's not, you know, it's not actively being managed by somebody. Well, that's we looked the, at that that's and the said, wording that we need, are missing, that it's not actively being managed. Well, and, that may be a, and that may be an important comment for you to put in. But the, the idea here is that, you know, in California, in many cases, it's very difficult to find something that hasn't been modified at some point in the, in the past. And we didn't want the mere fact that it was modified at some point in the past to kick it into this artificial um, framework that would then be dismissed as a, as a, as a water of the, of the state because it could end up in broad exemptions for things that um, are inappropriate and unintended. Yeah, so my concern is I have clients that have either wastewater treatment ponds or retention basins that need to get drained and dug up to keep them functioning with the proper um, yeah. level of water. And yeah. so if they have to go through this whole thing for a dredge and fill permit for something that, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes, we uh, we hear your concern, and as Paul mentioned, and I think I forgot to mention it, that when uh, considering your comments, it will be helpful for us to do the bold underline strikeout like we requested last time, and justification as to why that um, change is being requested. It really, really helps us out a lot. So thank you. Hi there, Tim Patricia from Humboldt Bay. Uh, excuse me for my lack of knowledge on this. I'm kind of new at this. Where do you go for clarification on your exemptions, such as temporary impacts or no impacts to sensitive habitat? Where is that clearly defined so that we can be on the same page as you when, when looking at that? Are you looking at the slide? So there's, there's some shorthand that we used in the presentation that um, doesn't appear in the actual language. So for example, when you talk about temporary impacts from the standpoint of an alternatives analysis, it, the actual language in the procedures is a little bit, is a little bit longer. Um, and it talks about no permanent impacts. And so, um, first of all, take a look at the actual language. Don't, don't look at our slides for, for real detailed questions like that, because there's some shorthand that we used. Um, and then if there's any question, I would say co contact one of the folks at the, at, the, at the state board here. And if it still is not clear, then that might be appropriate to flag as a, as a need for additional clarification of the procedures. So is, is previous documentation or history of what happened in the last cycle, is that part of that thinking or not? Give me an example. Uh, dredge disposal on the coastline, on the beach line. And the monitoring that went into the situation, into the disposal of the previous two cycles, uh, does the water board look at that at all, the science in that or no? Uh, for project by project, um, the regulation, regu I guess project by project basis, yeah, definitely we look at that. And there's other standards that are set, set by, uh, you know, in the Bay Area for, as far as dredge disposal that we definitely would still follow those um, conditions. I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question completely. And, and it though. might be that you've got a specific situation in mind and it might be more useful for us to have a conversation okay. after the meeting. Thanks. Yeah. I guess I have a two-part question. So, if you um, if you have a excavated basin in an upland area, um, that feature, as I understand it, cannot be considered uh, to offset um, in other impacts to waters of the state. So, if you're using, say, a detention basin is excavated in uplands, you can't use that feature to offset impacts to other waters of the state. Is that accurate? I think that that would mostly be accurate. It definitely would depend in order for to... Um... The question's a little different. Oh, okay. You're, you're asking about whether or not you can use an upland, uh, an upland area as mitigation for another impact. Is that correct? So if you excavated a basin in an upland area and created a, a detention basin that functioned as waters of the state, yes. that area cannot be used as, to compensate for impacts to other waters of the state. No, that's, that's incorrect. Um, so what we have in there and one of the conditions that we have is that a, a water of the state would include features that were created as mitigation for impacts to other waters of the state. So if you created that upland area and you created it as mitigation, that would be itself a, a water of the state. The, the basin is c created for stormwater detention. Okay, I, so you excavate I a basin in uplands for stormwater yeah. detention. Right, it functions now as a wetland because it yeah. provides stormwater detention. Hydro, you know, has wetland hydrology, hydrophytes. So it's now a waters of the state, but it's it's designated as a stormwater basin that was historically uplands. Right. So there's there's two questions at, at play here. The first one is is that feature a water of the state? And I'd have to know more. You're talking about the interplay between. This whether is the or not second part of my question. Yeah, is the, you abandon that feature, it becomes water of the state now. So if you abandon a detention basin that wasn't, you know, that you dug out, it now becomes waters of the state as according to your regulation. If it is historic and relatively permanent, yes, it could. But in the first part of it, you created waters of the state, but you didn't get compensation for that. Well, compensation is a different, that's a different thing than whether or not it's caught, uh, meets the jurisdictional definition. When you're talking about are you going to be able to use that feature as mitigation for other impacts, that's really a separate question. And I think that I, maybe I can help here. So 
No, you're correct. We wouldn't give compensation for creating a detention basin. We wouldn't know that because you're creating that upland and it's artificial, we wouldn't know at that time that it would take on wetland characteristics or that it would be abandoned. When we require compensatory mitigation to offset impacts, we need to ensure that that compensatory mitigation is going to last a long time and build, bring back those functions that are lost from those permanent impacts. Does that help? Um, I think I understand the answer, yeah. Okay. Um, Mary Lynn Coffey again. So following up on this line of questioning, and you'll have to pardon us, but it's really confusing because you have a great big exception to the exception. <laughs> so, yes. so we're trying to figure out sure, if the sure. exception to the exception swallows the original exception. Yep. Um, so with respect to these questions, if you uh, there's a couple things I have in mind. One is if you have a large wetland that was constructed in uplands, say in 77, but maybe in 1900, those uplands were wetland or estuary or something else. Does that mean that you have replaced a water of the state, and therefore you get no exemption under number two, wetlands created by modification of water of the state? So uh, can I make sure I understand? So you're talking about hypothetically an upland area that in the Wayback Machine was wetlands but has since been developed, went dry, and now you're digging again and making it a wetland again? Well, all of this happened in the past, right? So in nine, by 1920, it was an ag field instead of uh, the estuary that it had been, for example. And then um, in 1977, when it was still an ag field, it was converted into treatment wetlands. So what we hear all the time now is historically, that was a water of the state, and therefore it's regulated. Is that true under this exemption? So um, I'd like to point you to footnote one where we attempt to give a little bit more clarification on what uh, is a wetland created by a modification of water of the state. And we're saying in that footnote that it, this does not count a situation in which this was a wetland in 1900, it got filled, things were built on it, and then things have changed. and now there's a new wetland on it, we're not going to count go that far back. But if you are having a situation where it is currently a water of the state and you are modifying it, then that would count as a modification of the water of the state. Okay, so what what's a problem with footnote one is it talks about waters of the state, not wetlands anymore, right? So the ag field's in a floodplain. And there's been uh, certain situations, including in the last set of hearings on this, where the floodplain was discussed as a water of the state. So if we're talking about a situation where it used to be a natural wetland and then it got converted to an agricultural field with wetlands on it, so we're considering... No wetlands, no just wetlands. in the floodplain. It's a water of the state because your footnote one says created by modification of water of the state, right? So it, let's say for a moment, just to clarify it and make it more simple, there's no wetlands that meet that definition. It's just floodplain, just water of the state. I think I'm ha having a little bit of trouble following, but it, so it's a natural wetland and then it's gone. It's a natural wetland and then it's an ag field. It's but another, it's still but still considered water of the state. Yeah. If it's still in, so. Wait, wait, hold, hold on a second. <laughs> Um, so let, let's, uh, first of all, we're kind of going down a, a rabbit trail of a hypothetical that I'm not sure where that would exist, but let's, let's, let's parse it out a little bit. Um, way back when there was an estuary and through some process that estuary was reclaimed and turned into dry land. Okay, at that point the wetland ceases to exist. Now, some further point in time, somebody goes through and tries to create an artificial wetland in that, subs that previously dry land, okay? That previously dry land, according to, pri to um, that, that new wetland, according to that footnote one, would not be considered a modification of the water of the U.S. because that 
water cease to exist so that would be created considered an artificial feature and we would handle it through the rest of the framework does that answer your question yes as long as you say that that's true even if that whole area is in the floodplain so none of our definition currently and serena correct me if i'm wrong or missing something none of our definition right now references anything about the floodplain um, I, I know that other agencies consider the floodplain. That's not part of what we're looking at here. Yeah, I think I think the confusion is coming from. So, if it's part of the floodplain, does that count as an other water of the state? And unfortunately, the this framework is only applying to wetlands, so that's not a question that we're attempting to answer here. Yeah. If right, you talk but it's about saying that these wetlands are not going to be considered waters of the state, correct? Well, if what what Paul and I, I think, are trying to say, if it's going from water to water to water to water, it's still in. If it's going from water to dry to water, and your question is, well, if it's just in the floodplain, is that water or is it dry? And that's not something that our framework answers. And and remember and. Fleshing that out a little bit, remember that our jurisdictional framework only applies to wetlands. It does not define what a floodplain is, nor does the presence of a floodplain uh, affect our technical definition of a, of a wetland. So that's not really a um, material question for the purposes of determining jurisdiction. I just I also want to add, it's we It's a material we question do... the way you've structured your exemption. I... Well, so we do, I do want to say that we recognize that this is circular, that we are defining and providing a framework for wetlands, and we just aren't able to touch, we do recognize that. And there, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have received a lot of requests to do that and understand that there is a need, but we just didn't have the capacity to do so at this time. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I think the concern that Marilyn has is um, because of the WOTUS rule that stayed, which could be considered to be a historic federal regulation that does define WOTUS by floodplains. So yes, but uh, applicable to non-wetlands. So in the future, th this is not gonna answer the question of what's a stream, what's a river, what's a creek, and so. No, but it's just, a, you're, um, okay, so you just have it as wetland water of the U.S., not water of the U.S. generally. Oh. Yeah, this I, only I, applies I wanna, to wetlands. I want to jump in. Uh, you're correct, and, and that's the point I was going to make. This framework starts with step one, is it a wetland? And then you go from there through the steps. So this framework only applies to wetlands. And the first step is, are you looking at a wetland? And then you go through the rest of the steps. The question is, when you look historically to determine what it was before, because this makes that relevant, do you look at whether it was a wetland only, or do you look at whether it was well, the water of the state before? We will have to look at other waters of the state things. So I think one thing, I think we should just acknowledge that this is not going to answer all of those tricky questions. Because we're not defining all waters of the state, You will. this will still involve discussion and with the water boards and the permitting authority, hey, this is part of the floodplain. Are you considering that water to dry to water? I mean, we did the, uh, this is our first attempt at the jurisdictional framework and it can't eliminate all uncertainty. But, but you know, if you have suggestions on how to fix this, we would be delighted to hear them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we have another question over here. Somebody, please, this gentleman, a microphone, who is raising his hand. Thank you, Brendan. I'm piggybacking on all this questioning, and I appreciate the subjective analysis required in some of this and how it's case by case and all of that. Given all of that, why is the burden on the applicant to prove that it's not a wetland? Uh, there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, the first one is, um, if you read the definition of what artificial means, it's very broad. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there were reasonable and appropriate constraints to that. One of those reasonable, appropriate constraints is to put the burden of, 
of demonstrating that it is an artificial wetland on the applicant. Um, there is also a, a, um, a concern about resources as well. Sorry, but in some of these cases, you talk about going back over property records, going back. Some of the examples are, you know, decades long, previous property owners and all of that. How is a person supposed to necessarily do that, given, as we've just discussed, a subjective analysis required in some of these cases? Uh, we would expect, you know, um, an applicant to apply pro professional judgment when putting together um, a putting together a case, if you will, for lack of a better word, as to whether or not the wetland that they are proposing to impact is artificial or, or not. I mean, we don't want it to be overburdensome or strenuous, but I mean, if you could come up, and if you, if an applicant can't um, come with us, come to us with that, those evidence, if you will, um, then we would maybe have to look at that as a natural wetland. So maybe, maybe it would be helpful to, to talk about this slide a little bit. So. Um, some of the concerns that we've heard from the stakeholders, and, and frankly, we agree with these, with these concerns, is that when we talk about the wetland definition, the technical wetland definition, um, and frankly, I'll say whether it's the Corps' definition or our definition, it's, um, there is some question about how that applies. That shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. It's been litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court. This has been an open question that many people have tried to, to address over, we're pushing decades now. Um, this is not a trivial question to answer, and, and, uh, it's, and it's very difficult. Um, we have some options in front of us, the things that we could do. Um, one of those things that we could do is we could say, hey, if it meets the technical definition of a wetland, it's a waters of the state. Um, that creates some issues, and one of those issues is, well, what do we do about tire ruts? What do we do about, um, what do we do about um, puddles? You know, that's, and, and we recognize that's an issue that's, a, that's of concern to many applicants, um, and, uh, and it's, it's something that we legitimately need to address. Um, another option that we could have is to um, provide an itemized list of this is what's in and this is what's out. That's kind of along the model of the Waters of the U.S. rule. I'm not sure that that's going to get us there, specifically because we end up just pushing the definitional question further down the further down the line. What's a puddle? What's a tire rut? What's a wetland? What's a what's a ditch? What's a roadside ditch? What's a road? Um, so there, there, I don't know that we are going to find a solution that provides a specific answer written in stone for every situation. And I think we're on a fool's errand if we try to get there. Um, there has to be some element of, of discretion. The framework that we have provides a broad level of, um, uh, a broad framework from which to, to apply that discretion. Um, we do feel that because we are being very broad, um, we're painting with a broad brush in terms of what's artificial, and we're providing large exemptions for things that are artificial, that it's appropriate to put some reasonable constraints on that. One of those reasonable constraints is placing at the burden of the, of the applicant to demonstrate that they qualify for an exemption. That is no different from any other exemption that we have in, the, in, uh, in, our, in our programs. It is reasonable to expect an applicant to justify why they qualify for an exemption, and that's what we're talking about here. Hi, I'm uh, Kate Wheatley with Taylor and Wiley, and I wanted to kind of change topics a little bit here and ask about um, habitat conservation plans. I practice primarily in, um, you know, the Sacramento region, so there are two I know of here that are going to have an aquatic resource component, a 404 permit permitting component. Um, I see a reference to the watershed plan as a way to get an exemption from the alternatives analysis, but I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about how those, how the plans and the aquatic resource plans will dovetail with all the various procedures that you're setting out here for dredge and fill. Sure. You want to start? Go ahead. Okay, so uh, that's one of the things that I mentioned in the presentation that we added clarification to is that, um, and that particularly added the HCPs and NCCPs can be considered um, a watershed plan as per definition. You know, we do want to recognize that there are so many watersheds up plans out there that are created for so many different reasons. We need to ensure that that watershed plan 
um, takes into consideration all the aquatic resources that are within that watershed, the predefined watershed area, and that the opportunities for compensatory mitigation areas that can be restored or rehabilitated are um, identified within that watershed plan. Um, all that's spelled out in the definition. If it's unclear, please let us know. But then, so two incentives that we have built in is one that the project could be exempt from the alternatives analysis requirement if the project is planned in accordance with a pre-approved, a watershed pre-approved watershed plan, or excuse me, a water board pre-approved watershed plan. The second is that there's the potential that um, a reduction in compensatory mitigation could be granted to the applicant if it, the um, if the project is planned with that watershed plan. I feel like I said plan like four times, but. Um, the, the idea here that is that when we talk about alternatives analysis and we talk about mitigation, um, those things exist to ensure that we minimize the impacts and we replace what's lost. Um, if you're working within a habitat conservation plan or one of these other watershed plans, that planning activity has already occurred, and so there should not be a reason to revisit that. So that's why we have exemptions uh, built in for for those um, for those types of uh, those types of plans, I will say that to a certain extent, this is a placeholder language because there's there's um, um, there's some procedural questions that we've got to figure out in terms of how we would actually do that approval and what regulatory tool would we use to approve it. Um, and and frankly, there's some more work to do here, but we think it's important for us to provide that. Um, that um, ability to move forward towards watershed scale planning, um, and it's appropriate for us to do that now, knowing that there's additional work that we'll have to do later on. Okay, I think you kind of anticipated my next question was whether there has been coordination to date with the, at least, and I'm sure in Southern California, I don't practice there, but I'm sure there's similar situations, but has there been coordination with the state and regional boards on this um, approach with the local um, HCP entities? So far, the reason I ask is right now both are out, both the two that I referenced are out for public comment and I think this is something, this process may not be something a lot of people are familiar with, but I think it's very important for people to understand the effect it might have on their, their um, waters permitting moving forward as separate from the ESA issues. So just, just and that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we agree with you that it's important to, you know, have outreach and communicate that there are potential incentives for keeping, when people are developing these watershed plans to keep these things in mind. We have not yet, as far as these incentives built into these procedures, have not yet um, gone out and done that outreach to this, those stakeholders. Once, um, once, you know, when we get these adopted, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Uh, we do work with, um, you know, different counties and agencies that are putting together HCPs and NCCPs for other regulatory reasons, though. Uh, so I think that we should be able to um, to build in that communication through our current work through the regulatory program. Um, on that same question, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to whether the watershed management plans and enhanced watershed management plans that are being prepared under more recently renewed um, MS4 permits, phase one MS4 permits, qualify as a watershed plan like the one in the definitions for the procedures? That one, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, in my section, I have the stormwater planning unit, I have the non-point source um, grants program, and I've got the 401 program, and they all have the concepts of watershed planning. And uh, to be frank, there's a lot of work to do to harmonize that approach. And that's something that, um, that I see a need for. I'm not really sure how we get there just because the program focuses are so different. Um, but that's definitely high on my list of where I wanna go um, strategically in trying to figure out how to harmonize this. Um, so to answer your direct question, no, we don't have we don't have coordination at that level. But yes, there's a need for it, and I would love to to be able to work with you on this moving forward. And one last question: I, I'm a bit concerned or confused, really, about what a watershed profile is, kind of separate and apart from a watershed plan. Are there any of those that are any examples of those today? Bill, can you field that one? Yes. Um, uh, no, uh, we don't have any uh, examples uh, other than 
what we're asking for is commonly uh, provided in environmental documents, and that is simply look at your project area and, and give us a, a, a table, an Excel table, if you will, on the types of waters that you have in your project area, uh, how much of those waters there are in terms of acres and linear feet, and their general condition. So that's what, a, what we mean by a profile of aquatic resources uh, in your project area. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's commonly addressed in uh, y your CEQA documents. So uh, uh, we're able to compare then what resources you're impacting in your project area and compare that to the mitigation that you may be, be pr proposing in the watershed to make sure that uh, you know, there's equivalence there of what is impacted to what is mitigated for, and that the watershed remains whole. So that's what we're getting at. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you hear from uh, many of the applicants that uh, you know the time it takes to process permits is a paramount concern. And um, so assuming this these policies are adopted by the, uh, you know, early 2018 or something to that effect. Do you have a, um, do they just go into effect um, across the board or is there some sort of phased implementation so you're not overwhelming um, regional board staff with new policies and procedures or is it just, just start like that or is there some sort of phased approach to implement the new policies? We, we do not currently have a phased approach. I wouldn't be opposed to it. The policy will, do you anticipate okay. this causing more delays in, in processing permits? Just as a side note, the uh, procedures wouldn't go into effect until OAL approves them, so there would be a little bit of lag time even if they were adopted before they were being implemented. And part of, just broadly speaking, uh, one of the goals of our procedures was to look at what's currently be, being done too. So um, ideally what we're doing is partially codifying what's existing, and so we're not anticipating a huge increase in workload for the regional boards, and therefore we're not in anticipating um, increased delays in processing, uh, approving uh, permit applications. And I will totally agree with that with one caveat, which is part of the reasons why we're looking at these procedures is to drive consistency statewide. As, as Anna Maria said, there isn't currently a single set rule book that applies at the various regions. And so your mileage may vary depending on which region you're in. And I do want to oh. add, my turn, um, that we are working on things concurrently with these procedures, like a uniform application form, so that we will ask for all these things that we're asking for in the procedures in a clear, cohesive way, and then um, looking at how we can offer training to regional board staff. We are tracking all of our regulatory um, um, actions in a database, and that's what I talked about with the performance measures, so that we can go in and we can look and set targets to how long it's taken us to deem an application complete or take action on a certification, so that we can gauge and look and see how long it's taken us for to do these things so we can set and make improvements to that. Yeah, um, I, my understanding is a lot of the delays um, right now are associated for when you can deem an application complete. And one of the, ideally the procedures would help clarify what you need to submit and therefore we'll get more complete applications outright and then we can move on them faster. And, and I'll mention one last thing and this is why we put this, um, this slide in. Um, there are a number of things that we're looking at. You know, we recognize the need for, for a greater process efficiency too. Um, so there, there are a number of things that we're doing to address process efficiency, including, um, you know, more consistent application templates, um, tracking our own performance measures. We recently did a uh, Lean Six Sigma process on our on our uh, processes. We're doing some piloting of some greater certifications, the nation requirement. There's a lot that we're doing outside of these procedures to try and figure out how to drive a more efficient process. Um, 
uh, and I guess that's really the message is, is there's, there's things that we can do within the procedures and certainly where we've seen uh, uh, opportunities, we've done those, but I don't wanna leave you thinking that this is the sum total of what we're doing. There's a lot else that's going on behind the scenes. Sam, <clears throat> Sam Garcia with Pacific Gas and Electric and I think you might have answered my question, but right now my experience is probably different from a lot in this room that we don't necessarily experience significant delays with the current process. Thank you. Moving forward, <laughs> I see that almost every single one of our applications is going to require an on-site analysis of or analysis of on-site alternatives, and that's going to add significant delay in our first our preparation time, and I guess this goes to my question, review time from the board to go through a B1 analysis or similar type process, even if it's just for on-site alternatives, is a significant document. So and Sam, Sam I, um, I, you know, you and I worked together trying to do this latest certification on the Nationwide Permit 12. My understanding is we should be covering most of your activities through that, certi that certified Nationwide Permit, which should remove the need to do an additional alternatives analysis. Are you seeing that differently? Well, the, the, the uh, well, I uh, applaud you and everybody at the board for doing the, the most recent certification of Nationwide Permit 12, and that covers us for permanent impacts for a very small amount. Most of our large linear projects are, uh, if we aggregate our impacts, temporary and permanent along the entire right-of-way, it's going to be always go over that 0.2 acre threshold. And so just something to consider. Well, one of the questions I have is about timelines during the application process that we don't, I don't necessarily see any timelines uh, being proposed with uh, board staff when they're reviewing or process to help facilitate a timely review of applications. Bill, you want to take this? Yes. Um, I, I wanted to say, Sam, that now that this requirement is a known entity, uh, we expect that a lot of our applicants will address alternatives analysis in their CEQA document, which hasn't been the case to date because it's mainly been a federal situation requirement. But most conveniently, the, way, the, way, the place to handle your alternatives analysis would be with your CEQA analysis so that uh, it would all be all laid out you know, prior to uh, even submitting an application, ideally. Um, I just want to add on that, just when you're looking at the procedures in the red line there, we did make an attempt to make it clear that the alternatives analysis under the 4B1 guidelines are separate from any other alternatives analysis that you may have to do, including for CEQA, but that doesn't mean that if you uh, checked all the boxes and you did the same analysis in your CEQA document, that doesn't mean you can't get a two for one. And the... Um, Two other small things, just for anyone else that um, this may be helpful for, I want to point out again that our slides are shorthand. So when we talk about the tiers and you talk about, I think, mostly in projects that inherently can't be relocated elsewhere, if you qualify under tier one, like you're a very small project, that in, uh, so less than a tenth of an acre, you can still qualify under tier one. And then the other thing is keep in mind that depending on what your project is, maybe you can ask the, the permitting authority. They do have the authority to require less. So if they look at your project, hey, this is utility line. Hey, we've already permitted this. You know, maybe they won't need to do an on-site alternatives. And I, I want to add a couple of things. So just to, to get to your timeline, we're not proposing to change timelines here. We're still going to be going to the, takes us 30 days to make a determination on whether or not an application is complete. And then once the application is complete, you know, the timelines that follow that as per the federal regulations and the Permit Streamlining Act. So those are, no, we're not proposing to change. Um, the level of effort that would need to be included in on-site alternative doesn't need to be crazy over burdensome. You know, we want you to show us that this is the best alternative for that, you know, water body. I mean, if you're going to repla replace a power pole, 
are you doing it in the most environmentally friendly way that's the least damaging for the environment? So, I mean, if you just say that, even if it's just a few paragraphs, a couple pictures, that's just comparing one to another, if the regional board staff see that that's sufficient, that's sufficient, then that would be enough for y'all alternatives. And I see Javier over there nodding his head, yes. So, so uh, Javier, do you mind if I pick on you a little bit? Um, so Javier wa uh, was instrumental in helping us lay out some of the tiering, and um, he also had some, I thought, some really good work on defining how to approach an alternatives analysis in the most efficient way. And I was wondering, Javier, if you wouldn't mind talking just a little bit about what your recommendations are for applicants at Region 2. <clears throat> well, first, I'll start with the, the more comprehensive one, where you have to do off-site. Generally speaking, so, you know, we don't want to review a lot of you know, uh, papers and papers and pages and pages and pages of verbiage that don't doesn't really get us much information. So the way to go go through an alternatives analysis is to really the way we do it in Region Two and what we recommend is that you you talk to us and you work with us through the process. And you look at uh, alternatives analysis, there's technical feasibility, there's logistical feasibility, and there's um, cost. And then there's other environmental factors. And we, we generally work with the applicant to identify, you know, maybe logistics is, will rule out you know, most, of, most of the alternatives. Well, then I would want the logistics analysis to come first. Uh, sometimes it's... Uh, it's actually, you know, how much wetlands are going to be impacted or how much water as a state will be impacted. And, you know, we, we don't want to review logistics and, you know, technical feasibility if, if from the outset an offsite alternative will have greater impacts on water as a state than, than, the, on, than the preferred alternative, because what's the point? Uh, so to go through it efficiently, you know, as you hit something that rules it out, you rule it out and then you drop it from the analysis and then you keep going. And you don't provide uh, further analysis on, on the other factors that go into it. For on-site alternatives, um, generally speaking, you, we're really looking, there's different methods and to speak to like PG&E, what I've seen is um, maybe they're replacing a culvert and we may have questions on their methods for their culverts. Let's say they they want to replace it with uh, two double barrel culverts. We may say, well, we'd rather see if it's feasible. Can you put in one single big arch culvert, or can you do a bridge? You know that sort of thing. And that's that's the extent of the alternatives analysis. It's not uh, really any more rigorous than it needs to be. So so I guess the, the bottom line is, you know, we're, we're trying to set up a system of um, deferrals, exemptions, and, and tiered levels of effort to have a first pass at how do we minimize the level of effort without sacrificing uh, environmental protection. Beyond that, there are other things that we can do to help you make the analysis more efficient, and we're happy to work with you on that. <coughs> Couple quick questions. Do you anticipate doing a response, to, a formal response to comments documents like you did for the 2016 draft? Yes, we will respond to comments. No, we won't use the same format. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Second, on the uh, the cost issue, just a quick question. So the expectation from staff is that every regional board has the current resources, both personnel as well as funding to adequately implement this new set of procedures. So one of the one of the main messages that we want to drive home is that in, in a very large sense, um, we are not so much creating a new process as we are um, documenting and making consistent across the state existing pro, uh, existing processes. Now again, depending on what regional board you're in, they may end up doing a little bit more, they may end up do, doing a little bit less, and it may take us a little while to get straightened out where the resources need to go. Um, but um, but at, 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 on a statewide level, we should not be increasing workload through this. Because, I mean, uh, and one of the new elements, though, is this requirement on the applicant 
to reach out to the board staff for, for lack of better terms, pre-consultation activity, right? That, that's something that is, is, is a mandatory requirement so we can adequately check off the box to make sure that we provided the opportunity for regional boards to comp to, to participate and comment, right? Is that? It actually, it's not a mandatory requirement that you can um, request a pre-application um, consultation, but we do recommend it. But I, I know that's separate than what you're bringing up. But well, no, no, no because one of those three items, right, that requires the, as it relates to the alternatives analysis, right? Okay. The deep, since, deep since it's an or, since it's an or, or that means if you didn't do that, if you complied with the other, if, if it wasn't gonna, if it was gonna meet a water quality standard, and you address the concerns, but because you didn't provide early opportunity, that could be a rationale for deferring an alternatives analysis to the but regional. You see what I, I'm saying? I think I, I think I understand your question. Because it's an or, because it's an or, not an and. Okay. I, I'm gonna have to look into the or and. I, what I'll tell you is is the um, here's the intention. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we have early conversations with applicants. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to help um, to help streamline this. In many cases, we are going to look at the in, the initial information. We're going to say, hey, this is a low risk activity. It's not worth spending re uh, staff resources on. And we may tell you, thanks, we're not interested in consulting with you. If we have done that, then you have provided us an opportunity to consult with you, and we've declined it. And at that point, there's a there's a um, a, um, a requirement to defer. Um, so I think that should address your your um, address certainly many of your concerns, um, but at the end of the day, we do think it's smart to to give us a call and, and to work with us and and uh, and you know let's see if we can make sure that we're all, all on the same page as early as possible. And I and I want to add also that there are you know I think there are bi monthly meetings that the the core has that invites agencies to come talk to. What I've heard from applicants is that perhaps that those meetings do, aren't as productive as maybe they could be. And so, you know, if water board staff are attending those meetings and talking about the projects that are coming down the pipeline, that's already time that's being put in. We can just maybe make a better use of that time. So that is another uh, strategy that we could look into. And, and I will say that there's a conscious intent on our part to um, reduce the amount of time that we're spending on small incidental projects so that we can have those resources available to, to be put where we're gonna get the biggest impact for our, for our investment. Do you have Bill. another question in the back right here? Hi, I'm Bruce Dubing with Benchmark Resources. Um, on the alternatives analysis, I think this gentleman back here mentioned that using the CEQID document as the alternatives analysis. When you're crafting alternatives analyses in a CEQA document, you're looking at a range of resource issues, not just biological and hydrology mm -hmm. is issues. So would you recommend then perhaps amplifying perhaps the biology and hydrology components of those alternatives analyses to focus more on the more of a B1 type analysis? Is that how you'd yeah. see that unfolding? Could you say that again, Bill, in the microphone for us, please? Yes. Uh, so uh, the normal uh, EIR analysis is for the project alternatives. And so you would have to supplement it, as, as you were pointing out, for aquatic resources uh, alternatives, minimizing impacts and avoiding impacts to aquatic resources. Have we answered all the questions? Then I will, I will say from my end before I let Anna Maria close us out, um, we are very interested in hearing from you. We have this stakeholder meeting. We have another stakeholder uh, meeting, sorry, pub, uh, staff workshop on next Thursday. Um, apart from that, our, our doors are open. Our phone lines are open. Um, we're happy to talk to you. Um, some of you we've already reached out to, um, others, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be reaching out to, and certainly if, if we haven't reached out to, we'd love for you to reach out to us. I've left my business card in the back. Go ahead and pick one up. You can reach out to me, and then I can coordinate with all the staff working on the project. But, yeah, definitely, um, any questions that come up, just feel free to give us a call. Uh, and Serena, do you have anything else to add? No, with that, thank you so much for taking the time and coming part and 
participating and um, working with us on this and listening to our presentation and letting us answer your questions. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you again.